Hello. We can try that again. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Practice Fusion. I'm Matt Douglas. I'm one of the co-founders of Practice Fusion. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure to welcome everyone to uh, this SF Design Week panel on uh, changing behavior in healthcare through design. This is actually the second week of SF Design Week, right? So does that make it Design Weeks? Are we plural now? Uh, I thought design had a lot to do with branding, too. Well, regardless, I want to welcome all of you um, to this panel. We have a great lineup. Um, we'll talk about logistics in a second. Uh, this also happens to be Pride Month, so I uh, wanted to remind everybody you're in a safe space for uh, anyone to express their identity, uh, either sexual orientation or their gender identity. Uh, so please uh, join me in celebrating Pride Month. Um, for those of you that don't know, Practice Fusion is uh, the nation's largest web-based electronic health record. Um, we're used by about 32,000 practices in the U.S. That's about 100,000 people logging in every day to manage tens of millions of patient records. So you're talking about e-prescriptions, Diagnosis, diagnosis, scheduling, vital signs, lab orders and results, imaging orders and results. What am I missing here? Billing, personal health record, immunization, pretty much anything that a doctor is managing in a patient record happens on our platform. Uh, so we are, we are the nation's largest. Uh, we also happen to be the most elegantly designed. It's the easiest to use. Um, that is sort of me bragging a little bit, but uh, I'm... Uh, I'm pulling from uh, very specific surveys that point that out, and that's because we take a user-centric design to everything that we do. It's entirely persona-based. We do a ton of user research, and that's actually kind of novel in the clinical space. Um, most of our competition looks like they, their interfaces look like they were built in the 90s, largely because they were, but also because they don't iterate. They don't listen to their users, and I think we're going to hear a lot today from the, the presenters about how they uh, deploy some of those same um, approaches when they're designing their applications. So we're really looking forward to that. Our uh, recruiting team would like me to remind you that we have plenty of job openings. If you would like uh, to take a look, we're just practicefusion.com slash careers. Uh, there may be something that you or a friend uh, would be interested in joining us to, to help us as we're trying to expand, um, offer more services to more doctors and more patients. So be sure to check that out. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but in case you're skeptical that intelligently designed software can actually change behavior in healthcare, I actually came across something today. Um, there was a study where low-income Hispanics with type 2 diabetes who received health-related related text messages every day for six months saw improvements in their blood sugar levels that equaled those resulting from glucose-lowering medications. So an actual text message is as effective, at least in this case, as a medication can be. So um, some of those text messages were things like, use small plates, portions will look larger and you may feel more satisfied after eating or uh, time to check your blood sugar, please text back your results. And the prompts to text back results actually got even better performance. It makes sense, of course, but um, proving it with science, they, they ran a controlled study, and um, so pretty, pretty amazing that they're targeting really the chronic disease and type 2 diabetes, which is the, if we could get one chronic disease under control in this country, we could save so much money, not to mention all the, the health improvements um, and all the, all the improved in well, uh, improvements in wellness that would result. So probably preaching the choir, like I said, but don't ever let anybody tell you that um, healthy behaviors can, um, cannot be changed through uh, smartly designed software. All right, um, before I introduce our first speaker, let me talk a little bit about the format today, a couple logistical items. Um, first of all, I was supposed to welcome you to Practice Fusion, so we can check that off. Uh, we have four speakers who have all assured me that they will limit to 10 minutes. We'll try to limit to 10 minutes, largely because I want to make sure we get through everybody and then we get to Q&A where we can involve all of you. Um, we will probably have time for one question at the end of each presenter's um, their, their, their presentation. 
but I want to limit it to one. If there are other questions you have, save them. We will come back to the audience for Q&A uh, when we get to the panel. Okay, any questions? Is there a hashtag, is there, uh, SF design, hashtag SF Design Week? I think that's right. Okay, and if you want to tag Practice Fusion, we're just at Practice Fusion on most of the platforms, so feel free to do that. And I guess without further ado, we are going to start with Lindsay Garlock, if you want to go ahead and come on up. Um, she is the Director of Design at Lantern. Um, quick fact, Lindsay was a designer at Practice Fusion at one point, and she was actually our very first UX designer. So uh, I'd like to welcome Lindsay to the stage. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Matt mentioned, I lead the design team at Lantern. In case you haven't heard of Lantern, um, we make mobile programs to help people reduce stress and improve mood. Um, and these mobile programs use a mobile app with the support of a coach. All right. So first, I'd like to talk a bit about how we go about changing behaviors that affect mental health outcomes. Um, Lantern's programs are primarily based in something called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT for short. Um, just to check, how many of you have heard of CBT? Wow. OK, so a lot of you. Great. Um, for the few of you who don't, um, CBT is the most research evidence evidence based um, therapy out there and it really focuses on the, what you're dealing with in life now rather than the past. Okay. Um, so according to CBT, in order to reduce um, your anxiety or improve your mood, you need to look at a combination of your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, and how they work in this cycle um, in both directions to really affect um, Sorry, it's a little louder now. Um, to affect each other in every basis, um, or in every direction on a continual basis. So for example, um, say you're coming into work and you wave to a coworker. That coworker maybe doesn't see you, maybe doesn't like you, does not wave back. Um, you immediately go to the thought that he doesn't like me. Um, and then those thoughts cause you to feel rejected. So that kind of works in a very quick cycle. And then maybe the next time you come into work, you don't wave at that coworker, and that keeps you in that cycle. Um, so when we talk about affecting mental health, we really have to talk about this whole cycle because it can be interrupted at any point. Um, for some people, it's most effective to work on changing your thoughts. For some, it's modifying your behaviors. And for other, it's learning how to cope with the feelings or emotions. Um, and so for some, it's a combination. But basically, we have to think of all of these things together. So Lantern guides users through a series of techniques that addresses each of these areas. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I wanted to dive into the most difficult of these techniques, the most difficult behavior that we are ha trying to change. Um, it's focused on the behavior part of the cycle, and it's called exposure. All right, so people with anxiety often avoid what causes them anxiety. It makes sense. Um, so basically, this keeps them in the thoughts, feelings, and behavior cycle. So key ingredient of cognitive behavioral therapy is to get people to face what they're anxious about in a really controlled manner, and that's called exposure therapy. Um, until you can actually face it without having as much anxiety. So essentially, the point of this technique is to get people to do the behavior that they absolutely do not want to do, that they may have been avoiding for years. So this is not an easy task. Um, so how do we do it? We combine years of research in clinical psychology and research and practice in clinical psychology with principles and best behaviors of um, experience design. Um, to facilitate these user actions. Um, fortunately, a lot of behavior change design comes from psychology, and we're fortunate enough to have psychologists on staff, um, so we can really combine both of these areas. So um, a little later on, I'm going to get to into an example of something that people commonly avoid because it causes them anxiety, public speaking. Um, 
So, uh, but before I get into that, um, it's helpful, a framework that's helpful for me to think about um, and really us to think about um, trying to change users' behavior is BJ Fogg's behavior model. Um, so the model posits that you need three things to be present in order to make a behavior happen or a user action happen. Um, first, the user has to have sufficient motivation. Second, the user has to have the ability to do the action. Um, ideally, it's pretty easy to use. And third, um, a trigger must be present to kind of ignite the behavior. So basically, all of these three things have to happen for that behavior to happen. Um, and they all have to happen at the same time. So I'm going to break down exposure and exposure therapy according to in these th three areas, starting with the user's ability. Okay. So first, um, we want the app feeling as easy to use as possible so that the user feels like they can actually go through this application. Um, we use a combination of a large font. We chunk concepts into smaller concepts so they're more easily understandable. Um, sprinkle illustrations throughout so that um, it keeps users' interest. We use multiple choice questions whenever possible um, because that's a lot easier than trying to type or dictate into a phone. Um, and then we also guide users as much as we can. So um, we use kind of guided steps, guided concepts, and then we also use audio guidance when we can. Um, so um, another Another thing that we do um, to make the user able to do this action is called an anxiety hierarchy. So note this did not, um, we didn't design this, that came, this came entirely from psychology, um, but the principles are really in line with, um, with behavior change design principles as well. Um, so the idea is if you're afraid of public speaking, you start by exposing yourself to something much smaller that causes less anxiety and kind of move yourself up the hierarchy. Um, so a hierarchy for public speaking might look like this. The top of the hierarchy is obviously public speaking, um, and that might, say, cause you an anxiety level of 9 out of 10. Um, next, you could speak to a group at work, which would cause a little less anxiety, say a 6. Um, asking a question at a conference might be a four, and then asking a question at a company meeting, only a three. Um, so therefore, we have you start by um, asking a question at a company meeting, the smallest one. So we ask people to create this hierarchy in the app, kind of on their own, um, but whether or not someone has the ability to actually do these things in real life really depends on the actions they choose. And the app is not quite intelligent enough to tell a user whether they have chosen the right actions. Um, so we must rely on a human, which is the user's coach. Um, so um, users are paired with a coach at the beginning of the program. Um, and the coach kind of guides them through, um, sees their progress, and can message with them throughout. Um, and before exposure, they actually get on the phone with the users and kind of make sure that that hierarchy they've created is appropriate for them and also kind of guide them through the, um, through the technique in general. And once they have a good hierarchy, there's even one more baby step to make it easier um, to get into, and that's that the user is asked to imagine those situations um, before actually getting into them so that they're better able to face them when they, when they do occur. Um, so now let's talk about a trigger. So um, though users can do imaginal exposure inside the app, so actually visualizing what they're doing, they can't actually do the action until they're in real life. Um, so first we ask them to set a reminder, um, and we ask them to check in, um, ask them how long it will take so that we can check in after. But um, as some situations, you won't be able to predict when they happen. Um, so this makes the trigger a little harder. You can't really set a reminder. Maybe you don't know when that company meeting is. So therefore, the situation itself has to act as a trigger. Um, but because we've had you imagine it, really think about the details, really plan for it, then it is pretty likely that when you get in that meeting, it will act as a trigger. All right, lastly, I want to talk about motivation. Um, this is the hardest one to change in general when it comes to changing behaviors through design. Um, and this is what makes exposure especially tricky. 
So we know we have users who are motivated to kind of reduce anxiety. This is a little later in the program, so we know we've got some motivated users, but that still does not mean that they're motivated to do the thing that they've been avoiding for years, um, which makes sense. So we do a few things to help them with this motivation. Um, first, we teach users why it works. So sometimes it can help you get through something when you have an idea of why it's working. Um, second, we set up a variety of rewards. The first one being in the app, we've kind of set up a system of rewards that reward you each time you do a technique. So this one also is in that system. Um, so you get kind of positive messaging and imagery after doing the technique and you move down your path, which gives you a sense of progress. Um, coach messages are also, um, sometimes coaches will message you after you do a technique, so that can act as a reward. Um, for exposure, because it can be so tough, we actually have users plan their own rewards. So, so have them say, um, if, they, um, if they do the exposure, then they will buy themselves a massage um, or something like that after what's, what will be rewarding to them. Um, and lastly, doing something that you haven't done for years that you've been avoiding can be really personally or intrinsically rewarding. Um, Basically, if you really have been avoiding it, it can actually be exhilarating. Um, and because we've built it out into a hierarchy, each time you're doing one of those steps, you're getting a, a small intrinsic reward as you're going along. And then in case education and um, rewards are not enough, we also use accountability um, through our coaches. So the coach will ask you how it went after it happens. Um, and then in case the timing isn't right because of what I mentioned before, in case the coach doesn't know exactly when it's going to happen, we actually see users volunteering after they've done the exposure by messaging their coach to tell them how it went, um, which kind of shows that accountability. So in summary, um, we try to make the app as easy to use, make sure the user has the ability to do it. We use reminders and the situation as triggers, and then um, try to work with their motivation. So um, all of these things, with all of these things together, um, how often does it actually happen? How often do these users actually do, this do these behaviors? And the truth is, um, sometimes, not always, we know that some users don't make it this far in the program, so don't have the chance to do it. Other users skip through it because it is a very hard thing to do, um, especially for some people. And so, um, so we know that that is true. But um, when we do see it happen, it's incredibly rewarding. Um, we hear through coach messaging about ex stories that users have, experiences that they are doing um, that, that make a real difference in their life. So for example, um, a user who was very socially anxious took her to a party where she didn't know anybody and had an OK time. A user flew to Spain after being scared of going on an airplane for years. And then another one um, who had gone through a divorce three years ago used exposure to work herself up for dating for the first time. So when we do the make that change, it's incredibly exciting and incredibly rewarding. And so we will keep working to make it happen for more people. Thank you. We, we could do one question if anybody has something they'd like to ask Lindsay right now. Otherwise, you can hold them for the panel. Yeah. Hi. Oh, you hear me. Um, hi, Lindsay. It was really interesting. Um, I'm actually a behavior change communications specialist, so this is really interesting oh, for me. Oh, great. Um, I work in mostly international development at the moment, but I'm um, breaking into the domestic world again. Um, I'm curious, is there is there a way for users to interact with other users and try to coach each other, and is there a collaborative element of it? Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. It's something we've talked about, but actually haven't implemented in the product. Um, mental health is a little more private than some things, um, and so it's something we might experiment with in the future, but not right now. Um, we do at different parts in the app have users try to work with people in their lives, so kind of encourage them to work with a partner or a friend um, to kind of also keep them accountable in that way, but there's no kind of communication between users. Good question. 
All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's hear it again for Lindsay. Yeah, Lantern looks very interesting. Um, when, when I've done talk therapy in the past, a lot of those things are missing from that experience. So you're not actually replacing that, you're actually making it a whole lot better um, in a number of ways, especially with the triggers. That, that seems great, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, as, as she's coming up here, I'll introduce um, Autumn, who is a designer at Welkin Health. Um, she'll tell you a little bit about um, what Welkin does when she speaks, but it's a pretty new company. Um, been around for about three years, so I think you'll you'll have a um, it, it'll help you kind of give a little bit of context to where they are in in their part of the design process. Um, so please join me in welcoming Autumn. <laughs> Hi, thank you everybody. Um, so I am a product designer or UX designer, we kind of do both, we're really small, uh, at Welkin Health. And uh, Welkin Health is a modular patient engagement platform. Uh, we work with mostly providers, device companies, and pharma companies. So um, our platform helps companies adapt to the shift towards behavior-based healthcare. Um, we are now experiencing a time where healthcare companies need to do more to support patient engagement while also reducing costs. Uh, by placing actionable data in the right hands at the right times, Welkin is moving companies to become more smart, to become smarter about uh, how they're interacting with their patients. So um, here are some examples to illustrate that a little bit more about what we're actually doing when we're working with companies. Um, and to clarify, most of our users are other healthcare workers. They are not patients. Um, so we work with a behavioral health company and um, they have a tool that actually auto matches patients with therapists, but sometimes that doesn't always work out well. So they need uh, a real person to step in and do the care coordination of actually finding these therapists and then walking the therapist and the patient into having a relationship together. Um, and Welkin steps in for that part. Uh, we also work with a network of community health clinics and um, there are community health workers placed at each one of these clinics and they're trying to intercept people who are uh, very low income and high risk patients. And by doing this, they're stopping them from having more, more emergency room visits by addressing their needs outside of healthcare, but also in healthcare. So they're addressing their uh, transportation needs, their food needs, their housing needs, to try to see how they can impact them the most. And so they do all that care coordination through Welkin. Uh, we also work with a st spinal cord stimulation device company. And uh, if you're going to get an implant in your back, you probably want to make sure it's really going to work. So there's a pretty intensive trial period where they have a trial procedure done and then they work very, very closely with someone to adjust the settings and to uh, determine whether or not it, they're gonna be the right fit for the permanent procedure. They also use Welkin in this part of their workflow to help determine this. So uh, almost every company that we work for, for is in the behavior change business to some degree. And uh, whether that means the reminders to take a medication or adjusting to life with a new device, or maybe it's just uh, talking about healthy habits with a coach. Um, although Welkin is behind the curtain for most of the patient experience, I'd like to think of us as being the designers of the tools for patient engagement. I've bucketed these tools into three different categories. So communication is probably pretty obvious to you all. Um, nowadays, you just really need all types of... Oh, what did I do? Hello, okay, it's back on. <laughs> Um, you need all types of communication to meet people where they're at. Um, if you're like me, I screen every single phone call that comes in. So maybe email's gonna work better if you wanna get a hold of me. Um, so then with task tracking, we have three different groups. Alerts are kind of your mission critical stuff that you need to be reminded of. Um, the to-do list is your quick notes that you're gonna scribble on a piece of paper, except you're scribbling it in Welkin. Um, and your care plan is kind of the overarching um, patient journey as you move through it. And we'll get into more details about that one a little later. 
The third part is data collection. So uh, your basic info, then you also have your monitoring data. So that might be a connected device or it might be patient uploads through photos or text. Um, and then you also have um, assessments. So that's your qualitative and quantitative surveys tracking a patient. Um, and the dashboards is your whole patient panel high level overview. Um, so as many of us in this room know, digital health might be the slowest moving part of a very fast moving tech industry. Um, but we also know that it has the opportunity to make a really big impact on people's health. So, uh, you know, there's all these people out there that are highly, highly skilled healthcare workers. And they're like incredibly empathetic. They care so much about their patients. Uh, they're very knowledgeable, but if they're bogged down under tons of forms and faxes and spreadsheets and the emails and phone calls, and they're never able to really get to the patient care, then how effective and efficient can they really be? Um, so that gets us to the question of whose behavior is really changing. I like to think of it as actually both the healthcare worker and the patients. And uh, collaborating with healthcare companies to design the best workflows and then giving them the tools to actually perform these workflows seamlessly is really what's giving them uh, the power to deliver care the best. And what we're really trying to, doing is, trying to do is uh, turn the focus back to building a relationship. So uh, is this possible? Can we make this scale? Is there really like a set of tools that works for this, especially over diverse partners? Um, well, that's what we're trying to figure out. And as a designer at the company, I've been turning mostly to user research to try to figure out if uh, we're on the right track. Um, so uh, I, as we've been usually doing uh, usability studies and user interviews here and there, I've been recently getting more into in-depth user research on some of our core product features. Um, this is an example of a care plan. And originally, care plans were modeled after clinical nursing care plans. So you have your problem state, you have the goals related to it, and then each of the interventions listed underneath that goal. So that worked for a while for us, especially while we were working with a lot of providers. And then as our um, partners started to kind of shift, we noticed that people started using our care plans in sort of interesting ways that we weren't really planning for. Um, and it made us decide to rethink how we we're building them at all. What we really are building is a task tracking tool that's optimized for healthcare. Um, so there are kind of two major care journeys that we are seeing. Um, the first one is kind of where we started at. Uh, it's when you meet a patient and you don't really know how you're gonna work with them uh, until you meet them, until you get to know them. And it's kind of a more continuous care model where you may have starts and stops and maybe two steps back to get one step forward. It's really going all over the place. Um, and what we've discovered is more and more, we're partnering with people who have a more fixed patient journey experience, and that's maybe like a program that they're running patients to. So they need the ability to personalize, but they also know their patient uh, pretty well to begin with, and they also know uh, how they want to move a patient through their program. Um, so we are trying to evolve the care plan to better support this more fixed type user. Uh, we are thinking about three ways to do that. And the first is to have more robust templates. And uh, this is really beneficial for two reasons. Uh, it helps the fixed care journey type because it increases efficiency, efficiency and also makes the care more measurable across the whole patient population. Um, notes. Uh, so every, pretty much every healthcare worker I've ever talked to says they want to be able to take notes on everything all the time. And um, I think that even if you completely optimize a workflow for someone who works in healthcare and it's perfectly tailored to them, they're still going to want to be dynamic and personalize exactly how they work with that person. So notes are really, really useful in this area and they want to be able to attach them to the right places. Uh, and then last, uh, capturing success. 
So encouraging users to highlight those breakthrough moments, the milestones and successes on their journey can be really powerful. I see this as helpful in three ways. First, it's helpful to the patient to remind them of the positive moments that they've had um, and their success that they've, they've come so far in such a short peri period of time. Uh, second, it's really helpful to the healthcare worker, and I think it's easy to forget about them sometimes in the middle of doing a lot of sales kind of business, and we're working with the, the you know, C-suite kind of people who are dealing with us, and then we're working, thinking about the patient care, about what the, those people who are using our product don't usually have an option to use our product or not. Um, but we want to help them as well, do their job really well. And so I think it's partly to remind them that the work that they're doing is important and also allow them to capture those moments. Third, it has the organizational, organizational benefit of capturing really powerful anecdotes. I think if um, you've all been working at places where there's some sort of story that comes along on something you've been working on and it feels so meaningful and it really attaches you back to the work you do. Uh, so that's an obvious one, and also it's great for sales. Um, so um, for effective patient engagement, these are kind of the, the tools that we've been playing with. And um, although there is still so much room to learn and grow and refine as we go, since we're still relatively small, um, I'm really, really excited about the opportunities to do a lot of discovery here. Um, and so uh, we're going to continue on working towards behavior change through designing these tools. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, I did want to make a quick plug that I really want to want some friends to nerd out about design research, specifically in healthcare. So if you've also been looking for people, Come find me or email me. Thanks. Anybody have any questions for Autumn? You can take one. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Hold on to your questions. We'll come back uh, in the panel. Thanks, Autumn. For those of you not um, familiar or in the healthcare space, you know, Autumn mentioned care coordination. You're going to be hearing that phrase a whole lot more because everything that the federal government through Medicare and Medicaid and even private insurers are starting to uh, incentivize with providers and their support staff involves care coordination. Um, that is the way that, that we are banking on as a country that we're going to be able to save a whole lot of money. And when we're spending like 18, 19 percent of our overall GDP on healthcare specifically, every little bit helps. So it looks like y'all are on to some great stuff there. Okay, uh, on to our third speaker, uh, as he's on his way up here. Uh, he's the director of product design at Omada Health, um, who just raised $50 million. So uh, please help me welcome Patrick to the stage. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, it is an absolute honor to be here talking about the intersection of design, health, and behavior change. It's something I've been extremely obsessed with for a very long time. And it's actually part of what drew me to Omada. Um, a little over a year ago. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with Omada Health, uh, founded in 2011 at IDEO as an internal project. And part of why that project got started was this fact, the fact that one in three Americans today are at risk for type 2 diabetes. So a topic we mentioned earlier. Um, so that's over 100 million Americans right now who are at risk of becoming chronically ill. And I think the most shocking aspect of that is the fact that 90% of them don't even know that. And so Part of that massive risk that comes with type 2 diabetes isn't, isn't even known, so that's part of our challenge as well, is just being that educator. Um, because once you're diagnosed, a healthcare cost for the individual go up five times, and it's a pretty large burden on our economy. $254 billion just maintaining people with type 2 diabetes, and if you add cardiovascular risk, that's almost $500 billion a year. So moderate-sized problem um, we're trying to pick away at. And Omada was based on a DPP program, that's Diabetes Prevention Program, that was proven in 2002 by the CDC that a combination of a health coach, a group therapy lesson and tracking led to a significant decrease in people who were at risk for, for getting chronically ill. And so the smart designers at IDEO decided, hey, we could probably use technology to do this even better and do it at scale. And that's pretty much how Omada was born. 
And so just a quick overview, Amada is a basically two-year program that gets sold as a benefit to employers and insurance providers that is then offered as a, a free service to their employees. And it consists of a welcome kit that has a 3G scale um, and a bunch of other um, kind of fitness-related equipment. Um, and then they interact with the program for the remaining two years through the mobile app and the website, um, where they have access to their one-on-one -on -one health coach, 15 other members of their group that are going through this journey with them, um, tracking tools, what we call challenges, which are ways of putting the lessons into practice and the lesson material themselves. And so what was, I thought, most interesting about Omada's model in, in terms of what inspired me to join was our business model, which puts a lot of emphasis on design because we only get paid when our participants lose weight. So for each percent lost and maintained, that's how we make money. And so I stay up late at night <laughs> worrying that if the design team is not successful at turning design interventions into weight loss that is sustainable, we do not make enough money to cover our costs, which is a a potential reality. Um, but if I am doing my job and we are helping people lose weight sustainably, we're able to make enough money to keep doing this and keep working on it and keep getting better. So hopefully some relevant context. I don't think I've ever described Omada in less than 10 minutes, so hopefully that was successful. But I just wanted to share a few tips that we use when we're thinking about designing for behavior change specific to healthy lifestyle. Um, and I also think about healthcare and, and habit formation in our world a little bit differently because I think all designers are trying to create habit change. Um, it's a little bit more of extreme version when you're asking someone to take something so intimate as their weight, as their dietary habits, um, to lifelong beliefs they had about eating and ask them to change those. And so few kind of small techniques that, that we use in the process. So one is uh, the starting point. It's just how many layers of motivation can we trigger before we get someone even started in the program? Um, some of the ways we do that are creating environmental momentum. So we partner closely with employers and uh, our insurance providers to just get the word out. You know, we do co-marketing with them. We, we do print and email campaigns. We establish champions within the companies that people, are people who have been through the program and lost weight and can talk um, you know, with an informed point of view around what the program is and get the excitement and the knowledge of, of the program up. So that's on the ex extrinsic side. On the intrinsic motivational side, I think one of the most important things we do is during the account setup, we really help them identify what their why is. Why are they in the program? What is going to motivate them to keep, keep with this six weeks in when it's not going so well or, or, or it's challenging? And we hear statements like this, and this is actually from my dad who was in the program, I was about six months in, that he shared with me when I was doing some user research with him. He's like, I'm doing this because I don't recognize myself in the mirror anymore. My dad's not a very emotional guy, but that kind of hit me pretty hard. It's like, it's a pretty rough thing every morning to get up and look in the mirror and, and not recognize yourself. You need a photo of, of him and kind of his self-image. And we hear all sorts of super deep and provocative reasons for why they should, people should be in this program. From, I want to see my kids graduate from college. I want to be able to meet my grandkids. Things that are super powerful and have used effectively as, as part of the motivational process, we can really help kind of reignite their interest when, they, when they're struggling in the program. The other thing we do is set up a, a support team or support teams, ideally. And so one of those is obviously the coach, which they have access to throughout the program. Uh, yeah. Uh, another one is the group that I mentioned, so the, a cohort of 15 others that you're going through this journey with and can um, kind of share your, your trials and tribulations. Um, and lastly, we also encourage kind of re real life interaction. So it's usually helpful if someone can also have someone in their life that's either a spouse or we, or we hear their children are often helpful motivators and helping them remember to, to go out for that walk after dinner that they promised they would do. And then lastly, we try to create accountability as a motivational factor. And the scale is actually the easiest way to do that. So by stepping on the scale every day, which is kind of the first habit we encourage, we hear a lot in user research that it's that fact that they're going through this journey and someone else is watching and paying attention to them, and it's not just them out on their own trying to do this, that helps keep them motivated. So the second tip that we try to get through as part of the habit change process with every participant is self-awareness. Um, and so the easiest way we do this other than stepping on the scale is to track meals. And this is kind of one of the core focus areas of our, the first two weeks of the program. It's just regularly getting into the habit of going into the app or onto the website and writing down stuff as you're eating it because you can't really fix a habit that you don't know exists and that you don't understand. And so just through that habit of regularly tracking, participants start to understand what some of their habits are. Like, oh, I snack every day at 4 o'clock. Why do I do that? And that's kind of the point we want to get them to, is understanding the habit enough to ask why. 
because then our coach can intervene and say, um, help understand what those triggers might be. Similarly, we're pretty much monitoring every touch point a participant goes through throughout their journey and helping them identify those trends that come up uh, as they're going through this. Or we have a suggestion system that built by our data science team that triggers suggestions to coaches when we, we uh, analyze a certain trend. And so once self-awareness has been established, um, really the, the best thing we can do is encourage experimentation. There's no silver bullet for health behavior change. There's no one thing I can design that's going to work for everyone, which I think is a very humbling experience every day. Um, but what we can do is come up with a lot of like very approachable, easy to implement tactics that people can continue to try until they eventually work. And so in every week and every lesson, we're introducing these very kind of low hanging opportunities to try new activities from, you know, in this case, trying to increase your activity a few steps a day by parking further away, going on a walk during your lunch break, taking your calls on a walk, things that people can look at and be like, all right, yeah, I could see myself giving one of those things a try. And so we help them create focus by committing to one of those activities. In this case, um, going on a walk on your lunch break. Um, and then lastly, we want to celebrate the shit out of every time they do these habits and they, and they work because it can be very depressing to constantly be trying things and, and having them not work. And so even the smallest thing is stepping on the scale regularly, tracking a meal, we want to make sure that they're feeling rewarded for. And so we have a system of rewards, both through the coach messaging system as well as automatically through, this, through the app that's trying different techniques of reward, trying different tones, uh, information versus celebration, and finding out which one triggers them to keep doing the action. And we're basically constantly optimizing how we celebrate them. And so what happens in the best of cases when we're, we're doing our job is you know, the first thing is small breakthroughs. And so we're, when we're in user research and we hear things like, I, never, I didn't think I'd ever like vegetables. Like that's a sign that they've tried something and it's, it's worked. Um, so we're starting to build some momentum. They've proved to themselves that despite often you know, decades of, of struggling with their health, they're starting to feel confident they can do this again in, in small and incremental ways. Another one that I really liked, which was from my dad, he said, I realized that I could just have one cookie after lunch instead of two. So that is so, so perfect and so simple. He's like, yeah, I can keep doing that. <laughs> I'm still getting to eat a cookie. Um, but it's those little things that help him build confidence that eventually compile into habits. Because I think ultimately if enough experimentation and you start to realize what's working for yourself on a sustainable basis. And when we start to see people stockpile habits, that's when we hear these epiphany statements in user research, like, I feel better or I have more energy, or I'm no longer the type of person who drinks five Cokes a day. And that's a point where we know their self-perception has shifted. Like those habits have become ingrained enough that it's who they are to live this way. And it's not to say we should neglect them, but we've got them to a far enough point where they're self-confident enough to be managing their own habits and developing them, which is kind of as, as far as we can hope to get in a lot of these cases. And at the end of the day, you know, what we're trying to do is keep the business running and keep make sure that we're doing this at scale enough where, you know, we can keep experimenting and, and trying new techniques. And so after a year on average, we, the average participant loses about 4.7% of their body fat and keeps it off uh, for the most part by year two. And so we're continuing to do these studies. We're continuing to iterate and hopefully continuing to help people lose weight so we can keep the cycle going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Any quick question for him before we move on? Thanks for speaking. I have a question for you on the part about tracking your nutrition and your diet. I know that that's a struggle that a lot of other fitness apps have sort of encountered in terms of getting people to do that because it can be pretty manual. So can you talk about ways that you guys have sort of attacked that problem differently than other fitness apps in the space? Yes, that is probably one of the hottest topics on the design team week to week, um, because we also have a lot of participants joining from like um, you know, who are using MyFitnessPal who have done Weight Watchers and have all these preconceived notions about calorie counting and the importance of that. And so we take a very minimalist approach. We actually just ask them to enter their items and that's it. We don't ask them for quantity. I mean, they can add quantities if they want to. But for us, the, all we're trying to get them to do is get in the habit of thinking about it. And so while we can obviously analyze and give them more detailed feedback, if they very meticulously track, just the fact that they're tracking it all and building that habit and keeping that barrier really low gets us to a place where the habit's developing and we're starting to learn what they're eating 
So it's basically right now just enter your items every meal and then you rate the self rate the healthiness and portion size. And so it's really an exercise in reflection initially. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Um, for our last speaker, before we move on to the panel, uh, I'd like to introduce a senior product designer at Fitbit, Alex Lee. Alex Yee, sorry. There's your. Go ahead and yeah, use that one. You might not be on. There you go. Yep. Oh, it is working? Okay. Cool. Thanks for having me. Uh, cool. Uh, so I'm a senior product designer at Fitbit, um, and this is my dog Maui. He's not actually that big, but I just adopted him, so I just Aww. wanted to put him in here. Um, I've been at Fitbit for about two, a little uh, less than two years, um, and I've been able to work on in-app experiences and also collaborate heavily on the device interaction side. Uh, and my time at Fitbit has been really incredible and rewarding because, uh, you know, Fitbit is known as um, a healthy encourager, try to get you active every day, looking at your steps, talking to your friends about your steps. Uh, and it's not necessarily bringing users in from a medical uh, perspective. And, you know, certainly there are tons of people that uh, get diagnoses from their doctors, are encouraged to walk more, uh, pre diabetic perhaps, and uh, are encouraged to get a fitness tracker. Uh, but in some cases, it could be something social, like their friend talking about a challenge that they've been in uh, and, or their coworkers doing a step challenge, and they're like, hey, what are you talking about? Oh, I got a Fitbit. Um, or someone else, a family member giving them. Uh, a fitness tracker as a Christmas gift. Um, and so we have a huge audience of people coming in from different uh, directions and the work is really surrounded on uh, trying to motivate and enable people to achieve their health and fitness goals. What I'm going to talk about today with you is, uh, I guess, not so much on the medical side, but kind of in a way to talk about how to change people's realities through progress tracking um, and uh, celebrating successes. So the project that I worked on at Fitbit is called Fitbit Adventures. Um, show of hands, has anyone, uh, is anyone familiar with the challenges feature within the Fitbit app? See my Fitbit friends here, <laughs> they don't count. Um, yeah, so our current challenges that we have right now are pretty competitive and rely on social accountability or social competition uh, to get you motivated to hit your goals and beat other people. Uh, but there are a huge amount of people that are turned off by competition and don't want to share their activity data with friends. Uh, and so I was tasked with the challenge to create a new type of challenge, new Sorry, I use the word challenge a lot. It comes up a lot at work, too. Um, but a new type of challenge that would motivate uh, a solo user to hit their goals uh, and track their progress in a new way. Uh, and so the way that Adventures works is every time you take a step and you sync your Fitbit, uh, it'll move your avatar through a path in a unique, des unique destination such as Yosemite or running the New York Marathon. Uh, so this is a really different way to visualize your progress. Right now we have Dashboard, uh, which has a whole bunch of progress meters uh, that people are pretty used to. Uh, and as a way to shake things up, maybe uh, for a week or so, they could embark on a digital adventure that would take them through uh, unlocking beautiful panoramic photos, uncovering hidden treasures that had health facts, uh, fun facts about Yosemite, uh, mini challenges to run up a hill, uh, and things to just like shake up their normal day-to-day -day experience with Fitbit. Uh, so when we launched, we had a huge uh, positive response from our users. Uh, but to put that impact into perspective, so last year, uh, in 2016, there were about 100 billion steps among, among Yosemite National Park visitors. And this is kind of like general math, given that if you hiked up a mountain or if you got out of your car in Yosemite, it would be based around maybe getting 20,000 steps a day. So double the amount of activity that you do on a daily basis. Uh, well, 
less than a year, in less than a year, Yosemite, uh, or sorry, yes, Yosemite adventurers uh, amassed three times more steps than that, uh, collecting a total of 380 billion steps using Fitbit's ecosystem, uh, which is around 190 miles, which is more than if you walk to the sun and back. So it's pretty cool to see that people are really interested in uh, discovery of this new feature and taking their fitness to a whole new level. Um, so in ways that I've seen that help people is uh, for users who may have injuries that don't allow them to go outside and exercise or maybe it's winter in Wisconsin and like you're definitely not going outside during that time how can you also fit uh, exercise within your daily schedule and stay motivated to do so and hitting new goals and shaking things up uh, and so Yosemite Adventures allows you to unlock these beautiful panoramic photos and fun facts uh, in a way that's different and uh, people are really excited about this. Uh, so my favorite part of being a designer is hearing back from real users how they use the product and uh, how they felt about it. Uh, and so like the example I just shared about someone uh, who had a uh, health issue and couldn't go outside, they could now do so digitally through the Fitbit app. Uh, and then also my other favorite tweet was that someone actually chose Yosemite as their honeymoon destination uh, based on Fitbit Adventures, um, which is cool because it also allowed us to advocate for uh, people to go outside in real life and get those steps. Uh, and it was just incredible to see how much uh, impact it could make for people given um, taking their fitness to new heights. So I'm going to share with you about six design practices, um, they'll be fast, <laughs> about uh, what I use in my daily, day-to-day uh, -day life at Fitbit, um, designing for Fitbit. The first one is to clarify the exchange of value. So if you're going to ask someone to do something and change a habit, uh, you got, you've got to tell them why and why it will matter to them, why it will help them in the long term. Uh, and so one example of that would be uh, in a Fitbit adventure, you have this huge long trail that might take you three to five days to finish. Um, so a lot of people were a little hesitant to start it. It's like, what am I expected to do this in one day? It's like, no, uh, you can certainly try doing that, but we'll give you a daily destination to hit along the way that is based on your seven day average with the goal of if every day you hit it, you are increasing your seven day average, which is increasing your overall step counts, um, which will help your health. So uh, just kind of encouraging people to push a little bit beyond their boundaries, but also offering that uh, finish line at the end. Whenever I design, I always like to think a day in the life of the user. Uh, in many cases, so we have Fitbits on our wrist. Uh, we have a, it's a huge touch point. We can bother people any time of day, any time we want, um, but we probably shouldn't. Uh, and being careful about the context, what mind space are people in, who are they with, what are they thinking about, um, what are their goals at that exact moment. And looking into someone's life in that way will allow us to not only hit them at the right touch point to deliver the best value, but to also not risk churning people away and for them to feel annoyed or that uh, they're not getting any value of this or that they should feel guilty because they're not at a certain place at a certain time. The next one is, as uh, the other speakers had mentioned, is to create opportunities for celebration. So people love rewards. Like uh, they will do anything for a badge, and we have tons of Fitbit badges in our, within our ecosystem. We have lifetime badges, uh, but we also have uh, smaller opportunities to win rewards, especially in the adventures. Uh, experience, we have this thing called the treasure hunter badge. And so along the way, you'll pass these little treasures that if you walk too far away from them, you'll lose the opportunity to pick it up. Um, so it's actually really hard to get all of the treasures. I've only done it maybe once. You've got to like check your app and um, complete mini challenges. Uh, and so people, we found that people would keep repeating the same trails over and over again just to get a treasure badge for every single trail. Uh, and that was really encouraging because uh, in their brain, they weren't thinking, okay, I got to get all these steps and exercise. It was more, I need to get this badge 
because I, I have to collect all the treasures and I need to get this badge. Like that's all that matters. Um, and in, in turn, they're getting uh, a lot more steps in their day. Uh, and some of the other uh, speakers mentioned this as well, but uh, to, when it's appropriate to leverage competition and social accountability, uh, competition can certainly be a huge motivator, as we all know and feel motivated by games and um, other types of competitions like races. Uh, but social also has a huge uh, part of um, people's experience. People with more friends on Fitbit are 27% more active. And so studies uh, show that if you have friends and they are encouraging you, or even random people encouraging you, you will be more active. Um, but in this case, it wasn't very appropriate for the solo adventures. So a month ago, we launched uh, adventure races, which allowed you to compete with multiple friends on a map and race towards the finish line. The next one is to change things up. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit, but a lot of people are really hungry to find new ways to stay motivated uh, and to break the day-to-day -day life cycle. So um, doing something out of their comfort zone or uh, pinging them at a slow part of the day and say, hey, let's go run up a hill right now or let's like find some stairs. Um, but in a way that's very playful and fun and you can take it or leave it. Um, but essentially, a lot of my work looks at how can we uh, break apart context in a bit uh, for a single moment and get people to think about it differently, whether in a physical challenge or even the way that they approach um, any other type of challenge, uh, mental too. And then the last one is, of course, to design with a user in mind. So at Fitbit, we design around personas. Uh, and these personas are great uh, not only in the design process, but also in conversations with stakeholders. Uh, so leading a conversation within a meeting about, you know, with Isabel, we need to, she is not a competitive person. A lot of our uh, stakeholders, um, as you can imagine at Fitbit, are very health focused, very buff and active all the time. Uh, and so it was hard to get them into the shoes of a woman who maybe only hit 8,000 steps a day, wasn't very active, didn't uh, like to compete with her friends. Uh, and so using personas to drive conversations within uh, the design process was really helpful, uh, as well as making sure that we prioritize the right features uh, to hit the right market. Uh, and so at Fitbit, what I really love is that we design for everyday people. And as I mentioned, uh, this allows us to gain better empathy with people of all different ages, all different backgrounds. They came in through different triggers uh, and really see in how we can improve uh, the system. Uh, so in summary, uh, just a few design practices. I hope that you guys can find this helpful. Uh, it's I love being at Fitbit just because it's it's a bit different. Um, we can go super blue sky with like creating an adventure in Yosemite to something like how do we manage your uh, health goals and how do you like guided goal setting um, type of experience. So thank you, and that's all. Oh. Anybody have a quick question for Alex? Otherwise, we'll jump right into the panel. OK, if the presenters want to join me up on stage real quick. As we're coming up here, start to noodle about some of the questions you have. Ooh, sorry about that. A little interference. Try turning that off for a second. <clears throat> I may scoop my uh, chair over so we don't have that interference. That was not fun. OK. Um, so I'll be thinking of your questions, and I'll uh, I'll kind of get us started. Um, so we heard a lot about motivation and triggers today. That that was that was a um, uh, really interesting uh, portion of it for me in particular. And I'm curious, that, you know, this might be a question for for Lindsay or for Patrick specifically. Um, when you're balancing short-term gratification versus long-term benefit, what are what are some of the design principles or some of the the learnings that you've had? along the way that help you emphasize the long term over the short term. Particularly interesting, I think, when you're talking about food, right? Uh, it, it's, uh, there's some immediate short term gratification that um, really should be offset by some long term goals.
Son? Yeah, so I would actually say we try to emphasize more the short-term benefits, obviously avoiding the impulse, but in terms of really focusing on one thing at a time. And so that could be adding a vegetable, a meal a day and celebrating that. And then letting people realize after you know, that habit has developed a month or two later that it's part of their routine and that their weight is actually going down as a result of that. And so I think putting the carrot close enough that they can like, actually start to feel that benefit pretty early on and be confident that they've integrated that in their lives is kind of the technique we tend to use most often hmm. and making sure they're focusing on kind of one thing at a time. Is that similar with exposures? Yeah, I think I think it is about providing kind of immediate rewards, but also keeping people aware of the long term. Um, kind of at the beginning of the program, we do have people try to imagine their life um, after going through Lantern. And so what what kind of tangible things they're expecting to see in their life, be it like being a better partner, being a better parent, things like that. Um, and so kind of working that into the like larger picture as you're giving more kind of short-term benefits and short-term rewards is important. Yeah. Great. I'd love to hear more about personas. Uh, Alex, uh, you mentioned that, that, that that's a, a pretty big part of what happens at Fitbit. Can you talk a little bit more about how you use personas? Yeah, so uh, within different product teams that we each pick a primary and secondary persona to drive our design work. Uh, and so we create these personas not based on a single person that we meet, but more based on user research uh, on the general type of person that might go through a specific scenario uh, that would turn them into a certain type of user. So. Um, like for instance, at Fitbit, uh, the persona I designed around was Isabel, um, and she is uh, a little bit older, um, doesn't really hit her goals every day because we have a default of 10,000 steps. Um, so if you can imagine the, da the default of the dashboard being 10,000 steps and she hitting normally 8,000 steps, she rarely ever sees a daily celebration of hitting her goals. Um, of course, she can change her goal so that she will hit 8,000 steps and it'll give her a celebration. Uh, but I think there are other ways that we can help uh, people like Isabel hit their goals uh, or visualize progress in a way that maybe isn't universal for everyone. Maybe progress meters don't work for everyone. Uh, what is a different way to visualize? Um, with, so that's one example of how we use personas. Um, but we also like I mentioned, uh, use the personas within conversations uh, within our team members so that we can jump into their shoes and really empathize with them and see, uh, you know, not be necessarily designing for ourselves. I think it's really easy to get trapped in that and say like, well, I wouldn't want this because that, you know, I don't use technology in that way. Um, but having personas that are maybe very different from us will allow us to uh, achieve those results that we're looking for. Yeah, I think uh, keep making sure that you're not designing for yourself is probably one of the more challenging things in healthcare, especially being in the Bay Area, which we are in a little bit of a bubble, certainly fitness-wise. Um, so it's great to hear that, that you're taking that approach. Um, do we want to go to the audience? So I think we have, what, 10, 15 minutes left? We have a raised hand back here. We may need to pass some of these around. Sorry for the shortage of microphones. We, uh, back. Okay, yeah, yeah. While, while you're there, do it. Hi, this is a quick question for Alex. You were just talking about persona development. How much data do you have to inform your personas? Or are you approaching them more as user types? Uh, I think right now we uh, approach them more as user types, though we have uh, weeks and weeks of user research uh, based on participants that we see uh, and people that we interview. Um, so they're definitely not uh, there, we try not to make sure that we don't have a lot of assumptions about a particular type of user, and we always try to validate that. Um, so going uh, after uh, Adventures launched, we saw like w how many people like Isabel actually used our feature, and we saw a lot of good positive data that um, her user type was being addressed. Back here, we had a hand in the blue. 
Thank you. Uh, for uh, Patrick and Lindsay, uh, to what extent are you doing research on uh, somatic mind-body interoception skills that are a physiology layer below CBT, cognitive behavioral, looking at visceral organ functions, you know, tapping into deeper levels of perception of the body as tools for behavioral change? Um, so that's interesting. Um, we've recently been working on a program for um, kind of mood or depression, and that's actually something um, getting yourself to do things physically does have an effect on depression. So just having that kind of activation does. So we do think about, I'm not sure that totally answers your question, but it is a way to kind of get the, definitely there is like a mind-body connection and kind of figuring out how um, you can help do, have help people um, motivate themselves to do something physically that then can have an impact on their mental health. Yeah. Right next to, right next to him. Hi, uh, I work uh, with HIV prevention research. So we're working on uh, behavior change uh, uh, with sexual health. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about um, working in behavior change in health where there is no immediate gratification, where everything that you're doing is working towards a, a sort of a silent goal that once you pass that threshold, it becomes really important as to why you were doing that. But the hope is that you will never pass that threshold. So there's no, there's no weight loss or anything that goes with that that can keep you going day to day. And if you could also talk about whether the immediate gratification of the badges um, in a context like that actually in your data shows that it encourages people to keep going. Is that relevant to anybody in particular? Autumn, maybe there's a component of helping HIV specialists automate some of what they do. Uh, the only thing I can speak to regarding that, not, not to your specific case, but uh, the community healthcare workers that we work with for very, very low income, high risk people who are dealing with so much on their plate. When I talk to users who are working with patients that um, are, you know, having a really hard time managing their health. So it, it relates a little bit to what you're saying and that like, they don't really like see the immediate benefits of what they're doing. They're just trying to get by. And um, I think it's important then to tap into the people giving the care and keep them motivated. Um, that I, I think that that's the closest that we've come to that. Um, and to help them, to help, to help them remind them that the, what they're doing is really important and to keep reaching out to develop their empathy. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's about as close as I can talk about that, but I don't know if you want to add anything about badges. <laughs> Um, so I will say uh, I've thought a lot about that and um, how hitting weight goals are very long term. Um, you know, it's not overnight, uh, but a lot of what can help is to educate people uh, about health and how changing their diet, how changing their activity can get them closer to those goals. Because uh, I think we, uh, especially in our industry, can assume that people know already know a lot about their health. Um, like, honestly, I just found out what a macro uh, component is within uh, logging a meal. Um, and that was something that now I will better understand how food breaks down uh, and can make better food choices because of that. But if I were to assume that, oh yeah, like you'll log your dinner and like it'll just tell you exactly what, like you should just have less dinner. Like, I, I think, breaking down the information um, in ways that people can think more about uh, is helpful that can give those uh, short-term uh, accomplishments rather than uh, waiting until the long-term goal is hit uh, to feel accomplished. I don't know if that helped answer. Um, but yeah, people love badges. We have a lot of data. People love badges. Um, they just want more and more and more. So yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Do we have uh, another question? Hang tight for the microphone. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Lindsay. Uh, Patrick spoke to this 
a little earlier about kind of layering momentum and kind of creating this initial environmental momentum when people don't even know they have an issue or could turn into you know more serious problems and i can imagine with mental illness there's a lot of taboos so how does lantern approach kind of this creation of initial momentum and awareness um yeah that's a good question so um so I'd say we do get a fair amount of people through the door who don't kind of realize that they um, do have a lot to change or do have a lot to work on. Um, one of the ways it's interesting, just the combination, the word stress versus anxiety. So a lot of people come to us um, thinking about stress and thinking that I have all these external triggers, um, but then we actually, um, through our stress program, do a lot that we also do in the anxiety program. So it's really, um, it really relates that way. So that's one way to get people in. And also um, through tracking. So people are really, uh, the first time they come in, they're taking an assessment that's clinically validated to kind of tell them um, how they're doing along these scales. And then throughout the program, they're kind of tracking to see both the variability in their mood and their anxiety, um, but just kind of to tell them where they're at too. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple more. They're in the back there. We have Squawk Box, Catch Box. Speak right into it. It's a microphone. All Hold right. it close. Um, there you I'm go. I was wondering if each of you can speak to the relationship you have with the healthcare providers, whether that be through research grants or if it's someone that's actually on the team that's providing that feedback or if it's a consultant. And that may inform some of these long term outcomes that you guys can then model your short term goals towards. Sure. So, um, so we have um, we do have clinical psychologists on staff. So that's um, who we work with primarily. But then also um, one of our partners is UPMC, which is a large kind of medical provider. And so we're kind of meeting with them on a regular basis and actually running studies um, with them on our pro on our product to see kind of how it's doing in the real world in more clinical settings. Uh, well, a few of our partners. Um, well, one of our partners in particular is using us to power their clinical study. So um, they're actually running a lot of, of their their tests and working with patients through our software to try to validate what their therapy is. Um, so that's one way. And then another way, um, the community health clinics that I was talking about, they work with us through a grant um, that they got. And part of the grant is us um, measuring a lot of these um, metrics that are proving whether or not this has been effective. And that's uh, help, very helpful to them, obviously. But then we're also getting the feedback from that, which has been really helpful. Uh, we have a medical affairs team that is constantly studying, working with uh, partnership organizations to kind of prove some of the therapeutic techniques we're using. We also have like uh, behavioral psychologists and PhDs in physiology on the team that are constantly advising uh, the stuff that we're designing on medical best practice. And then actually I interpreted the question as more like who would we want to work with? And so as we're looking towards Medicare, obviously kind of one of our ideals is to be able to be offered by a physician uh, to their patients who are overweight or at risk for type 2 diabetes. So we're in early conversations with doctors about what that context looks like and how they might offer OMADA as a, as a benefit to one of their patients. Um, Fitbit, I, I'm not sure. Uh so much on who peop who Fitbit works with, because um, I've been mostly on the in-app side, so. No worries. <clears throat> okay, I think we can do one more. Anybody else have another burning question? Okay. Not burning, <laughs> smoldering maybe, I don't know. Smoldering, sure. Um, so do you have any uh, perspective? Uh, healthcare can change dramatically quite soon. And um, the emphasis, I think, is going to be shifting in ways that are pretty profound, probably. Uh, that means probably less support from government and a lot of other things. Maybe it means more self-support in some ways, but also means less support from the sort of larger forces, precision medicine, and so forth. So what do you, do you have any, any of you have any thoughts about the in potential impacts in the trajectory of healthcare going forward and how you fit into it? It seems like it might be particularly interesting to some of the care coordination that's going on. Am I putting you on the spot? <clears throat> Give it a shot. I think um, 
this isn't quite a, a design related question. So there's other people on my company who could speak a lot more about this in depth. Um, I mean, it's everything. Design related question for sure. Well, totally, but I, it's not like a, it has a real strong business component that I can't speak that eloquently about. But um, I think that uh, part, partly what we're seeing is we have been shifting more towards device and pharma companies. Um, partly because there's a real strong pressure on them to make sure that if they're going to be giving people these tools and uh, these pharmaceuticals that they, they work and that um, people are satisfied with them. So there's been a lot more pressure on the um, less on the, in, the insurer side, but more on the companies that are providing products and services to do a good job of delivering it and making sure that their um, customers are happy and want to keep using them. Um, so uh, if I guess that's to say like, not that I normally am like, yay, capitalism, but at least <laughs> there is um, a component there. There's a, there's a pressure of, through competition um, through these from these companies to take care of their patients better. And we're seeing that just more and more. I think just to reflect the Omada perspective, you know, diabetes specifically is not something that we're going to solve our way out of anytime soon other than value-based care. And so the fact that, you know, right now people are dying more frequently of um, diseases that they could prevent than infection, infectious ones is a sign that this shift towards value-based care is kind of here to stay. And we've seen commitments from uh, health providers like Aetna who, who have promised to move 60% of all payments to value-based care by 2020. And I think regardless of what happens in the pol political climate, maybe we don't put so many eggs into Medicare, for example, but I mean, think that shift and that train is like pretty much left the station and that we're moving that direction regardless. And that the value that's being placed in people who are investing in lifestyle-based care is not going to change anytime in the near future. Okay, if y'all could help me uh, thank Autumn, Lindsay, Patrick, and Alex for being on the panel today. Thank you very much. I think there's a little more booze and maybe a little bit more food in there. Thank y'all for coming. <laughs>